me is I'm not a morning person. <laughs> oh, but I have enough just to get out of bed. Well, again, the point is spend a part of your day. The best part of your day. If your best part of your day is before you go to bed, you've got 15 minutes of energy. <laughs> this sounds bad to say because I know some people read and go to sleep. But whatever the best part of your day, give it to the Lord. Take 15 minutes and look at the Bible. Pick up a devotion and begin to study. If you set your God who is just consistent in that, it will give you the strength that you need for those times when the world is not going to be done. The second thing you need is to organize your life so that you can give God a, a, a priority and receive His blessings is to give Him the first part of your week. So the first part of your day or the first part of your week, what does that mean? Well, you're doing that right now. Sunday is the first day of the week in our society, in our American culture. And by saying, I'm going to commit Sunday mornings to God. And there's a lot of temptations to do other things. You know, whether it's, uh, I know, you know, some of our young people are playing in sports. And sometimes there, there's uh, other activities that come up. Or, or maybe there's an early bird shopping thing. And the temptations in the world try to draw us away. But if we want to, if we want to receive God bless us, we've got to say, I'm going to make the first day of the week an important part of my life. Because it's a habit. If you want, oh, I go to church because it's a habit. That's what I do on Sunday morning. It's a habit. But to give that first part of the week uh, to God. You know, you can debate about whether you need to go to church or not to be close to God. I know a lot of people say, I don't need church. I read my Bible. I'm doing that first thing. And I talk with other Christians uh, from time to time. But the truth is that the church is a gift from God for us. So that we might be able to encourage them with each other. It also, when we gather for worship and we make it a priority in our life, it makes a statement to the rest of the world. We live in a culture that is rapidly moving away from faith and religion into some kind of a cultural religion. And when we say, well, we're going to worship God, we're going to make that a priority. People look at us. They may look at us funny. But at some point in their life, when the storms are, are, are knocking down the things in their life, they're going to say, how are you doing? And you're going to be able to say, on the first day of the week, I'm with the Lord in the community of the church. And they encouraged me. They lift me up. When the storm came and almost devastated my life, I had the people in that community who stood there with me. And I felt the presence of God in a way I never felt it, walking along the beach or out in the Billy Graham, the famous evangelist, consistently rated as one of the most influential men in America. Billy Graham said this, Christians who are not actively involved in the life of a local church remind me of what happens when a burning coal is removed from the fire. Once that coal is removed from the bed of glowing coals, it gradually cools and inflame God's. You know, that's the importance of what we're doing together. No wonder the Bible warns us in Hebrews 10, and I think it's part of our covenant as well, that you should not stay away from church meetings, as some are doing, but you should meet together and encourage each other. God designed for us from the very beginning is for us to set apart this time of worship and to be together. And in the early church in Acts, that's what they did regularly. Every day they came together in some way to worship. So what's one day? Or two, when we start Wednesday nights again this week. Or three, if you sing with the choir. Or four, if you're on the trust of well, okay. <laughs> I'm pushing. Third, this is the one that you're not going to like. Third, we have to set our GPS, our God positioning service, to give God the first part of our finances. Ouch. <laughs> we don't like to talk about money in church. Oh, that church, all they want is my money. Well, the truth is, once you start looking at God's Word and reading what Jesus has to say, Jesus is never afraid to talk about what you have, your possessions, your finances. As a matter of fact, it is the most talked about topic in Jesus' core teaching. Because, as He said in the Sermon on the Mount, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. The things that you invest yourself in and your life in, that's what's important to you. And so if you're investing your life and your finances into food, and you know all the great restaurants, and you can build the menus and the prices, and you can show your credit card statement showing how you've been to them all, well, that tells people something about you. Where your heart is, that 
And so Jesus is very plain, and he says that if you want to, if you want to be in line with God and receive his blessings, then you need to, to deal with the rest of your life. Sometimes we like to compartmentalize all that stuff. Oh, you know, that's my work. But with Jesus, we are a person in totality. You know, there's one verse of scripture that we often lift up in stewardship time from Malachi 10. It says, bring to my storehouse a full tent of what you earn. Test me in this, says the Lord, and I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. This is the only verse in the Bible, I'm told, where God says, test me. Test me. You give me 10%. You do as I said with your finances. You trust me. And I will bless you in ways you'll never know. Dave Murray, one of our members who's now gone to be with the Lord, used to say, I love the story, some of you have heard it, but Dave said he finally was reading the scriptures and he got that and he decided to start to tie. And so that first week he figured out how much money he was making and he went to church and wrote out a check for 10% and he put it in the offering plate. And on Thursday he got a call from the church collector saying, uh, uh, Mr. Murray, uh, there's no problem with your check. Back. <laughs> Dave was a little embarrassed. He made it right. He kind of figured things out. The next week, he figured it out. We didn't check 10%. The Thursday, the church went off. It's a murder. It's really great what you're doing. But, uh, you know, the check came back again. And Dave said he had to try harder. And you know, the truth is, when we give to some place that we're not used to giving, it is hard. It means we've got to rechange some of our priorities. It means that some of the things that, that are so important is we have to whittle away so that we can make it happen. And Dave said he, he did that. And he made it happen. And those of us who knew Dave, I remember one day we had a couple who had a prayer request. Most of them, I can think about it. That prayer request of someone who needed $100. Here's Dave who would retire. Five minutes later, I see him. He's kind of open this mercy. And he's got a Given to that person, they pinch a hundred dollars. That's an awful lot of burgers at McDonald's. <laughs> I asked him about that. I said, What would you do? He says, Give me the money. They asked God for the money, and God put it on my heart to give it to him. I thought, Wow, how many people can do that? How many people can do that? That's why when Dave said he wanted to talk, I said, Dave, any time. And I know your heart is with God. Yeah. 